G'day guys, I'm Simon. I'm the founder of Mindful Men, a therapy business dedicated to supporting men open up about mental health and disability. I'm going to be a fortunate guest of the Online Prosperity Show. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about men's mental health, burnout, how mindfulness can improve our mental health, and what guys can do to start opening up and get the help that they need. Welcome to the Online Prosperity Show, where we bring you inspiring stories and conversations about mental health and well-being. I'm your host, Prosper Tarawinga, and today we have a special guest with us. Simon, how are you doing, my man? I'm good, Prosper. Thanks so much for inviting me on the show. I'm really keen to have a chat and, and share my insights into whatever you're about to ask me. So... Absolutely. Well, I'm a little bit jealous with where you are right now. I'm looking outside and it's cloudy and it's Melbourne and you're in the Sunshine Coast. So I bet you're having a lot more fun than I am uh, right this moment. But I digress. For those that are watching right now and wondering who Simon is, Simon is a social worker and a men's therapist who's dedicated his life to helping men open up about their mental health programs and problems okay so i want you to join me in welcoming simon ryan the founder of mindful men and um we are going to be talking about his life story what got him into what he's doing right now and how he is actually helping um, men to be do and have a happier existence now Simon, it's a pleasure to get you on the show today. Tell us a little bit about how you actually got started with Mindful Men and what was happening in your life that time. Well, how long have you got? Because we're going to unpack almost 40 years of, of life, really. But to, to shorten it for you and for the audience, I guess Mindful Men was born out of my burnout story. So I've got multiple mental health stories. Um, I'm a mental health advocate and lived experience um, therapist as well. So I bring about 30 plus years of lived experience of mental illness to my therapy clinic. And 2020, roughly, I want to say that year, I burnt out. So before I was doing Mindful Men, I was had 15 years in the public service. I was working in a full-time job with high, high KPIs, high pressure, high stress, um, in that time, I was studying a master's of social work. So I was on my social work journey at that stage, but I was studying part time at the master's level um, at university. We had two kids during this this period. So we had a, a three year old and a one year old and we had COVID lockdown. So if anyone remembers COVID in 2020 and and Prosper, I know you're down in Melbourne, so you had it a lot worse than than us up here in Queensland, but their lockdowns all coincided together and I guess my mental health wasn't really uh, very good at that point in time and so it all came to a boiling point where I I remember being on a phone call with my boss and they were saying Simon some of your caseload is getting a bit out of control it's taking you longer to do stuff and I just broke down crying and I said I think I'm I think I'm burning out I think I'm burnt out I've never said those words before I've said I think I've got mental health issues before but not in a work context. And so this was the first time I opened up in, at work about mental health specifically. And I took five months off of work and I had to to recover. And I was during that time, I was basically like a, a couch potato. I couldn't do anything but sit on a couch pretty much. I had lost all joy, all motivation, physically, mentally, emotionally. I was just spent. And Mindful Men was born out of this process, out of healing. And and I remember it started off as me taking off the mask of mental illness and saying, I live with mental health conditions and I have so since I was eight years old. I haven't told anybody about this except for my doctor, my GP and my wife. Um, and by doing that, I started an Instagram page, which also turned into a YouTube channel and the Mindful Men podcast to share my story as a way of advocating for mental health, showing guys that it's okay to talk about mental health. And then that blossomed into Mindful Men, the therapy business, which I have started over the last nine to 10 months ago. Um, I left that old public service job, jumped into a, a, my own therapy business, where now I work one-to-one -one with guys across Australia, supporting them with their mental health, but also disability as well. So it's something I'm really passionate about, but it comes from a place of pain. 
and yeah it's it's the fuel to my fire now and and i love what i do and i love supporting the guys that i support fantastic and thank you so much for sharing that story especially the intricate details um i'm just going to try and unpack that a little bit now you know everybody is told to grow up get a job get married um and you know leave the life just like everybody else is doing um which i'm supposing you took that path you know you had a cushy job with a public you know service for 15 years and obviously uh you would have been married for you to have those three two kids the three-year-old and the one-year-old um mm-hmm. what what went wrong when you were leaving the textbook style of life yeah i guess you're talking about the australian dream aren't you and or wherever you are in the world it's the dream it's to grow up have you know get married have kids have a house um so many people i guess if we're talking about where we currently are 2023 so many people are struggling with this with all the financial pressures and so forth but i guess backtrack to when this was happening 2020 I think there was, it was just a combination of all the above, all that stuff happening that led to things falling down. And I guess to take it back even, even further, like I grew up in the, I grew up in the eighties and nineties in the Northern suburbs of Adelaide in South Australia. And for anyone who doesn't know what that kind of area is, it's very working class, it's trades, it's a lot of pockets of welfare, it's lower socioeconomic. And so the mantra of what it meant to be a boy and then a man and then you know that australian dream was for guys to suck it up don't show emotion don't cry don't talk about your feelings and you know be hard be tough because this is what apparently a a boy and a man should be and then so when i was eight years old and i developed obsessive compulsive disorder a, I didn't have the words to talk about what was happening and B, I didn't have an outlet to talk about it because I was taught, like so many boys and men that I work with, you've got to suck this stuff up. You know, it's not okay for a boy or a man to talk about their emotions, particularly in the northern suburbs of Adelaide. And then, but as I've gone through my life, I've discovered that this is this kind of discussion is happening Australia-wide, if not worldwide. You know, I've got my own podcast where I talk about this exact topic with guys across the country, you know, you know, in America, Africa, Asia, Europe, it's all happening everywhere. It's this mantra of boys and men weren't allowed to show emotions for the most part. There's the, the, there's a lucky few who had someone who they could talk to about this type of stuff or who were connected in with a psychologist or a counselor, someone who could talk about men's mental health, but the majority didn't have that. And so that was reinforced in the home, is reinforced at school, at the sports club, even on TV. And, you know, I remember 80s and 90s, we get home from school or it's the school holidays and we're watching things like The Terminator and Rambo, Die Hard. Great movies. Like, I love the movies, but they reinforce this hard male role model figure. It's someone who's tough, it's someone who's strong, someone who's going to get a bullet or a knife, you know, knife wound. They're going to push through a wall of fire and still survive and still be the go- the go-to guy that everyone wants to emulate. And so this was ingrained at a very young age, is these, and we call them in social work world, is the social constructs of masculinity. It's how we're taught to be. And so for a long time, I battled with that internally. And so from 8 to 28, I didn't talk about my mental health at all to anybody. And what that looked like was too much alcohol, drinking to numb the pain, but also to slow my mind. So for anyone who who hasn't experienced obsessive compulsive disorder before, my mind races at a billion miles an hour. It's like having a hundred websites open all at once and you're trying to read them all simultaneously. And so my mind is like that often. And so I have I've used alcohol previously to slow everything down, but then also to socialize as well. You know, as I've got older, become more introverted and so alcohol becomes a way for me to socialize so these are all like unhealthy coping mechanisms that i've developed also because i see other guys do the same and so i think this is how we deal with this type of stuff and then if i fast forward until i was 28 and my now wife encouraged me to to go and see my gp she recognized i was drinking too much she knew i was hurting and she knew that i had changed into a person that she hadn't met before And it wasn't a great person, but internally for me, I knew this person existed because I've been living with this person for my whole life. 
And so that was that prompted me to go and see my GP and say, I think I've got a mental health condition. Never said those words before. And this is at 28. And that's what started me, my 11 year, I guess, recovery process. But through that time, that story was kept to my wife, to my GP and to the various counsellors or therapists that I've seen over the years. And if I get to, you know, and thinking about my public service career, but also my schooling, also my university, relationships, everything, it was kept quiet by a high level of perfectionism. And so another coping strategy for me was to be perfect at everything I did, to do things really well. So if I was on the sports field, I would train harder and I would play harder than most other people because I didn't want to fail. I wanted to be seen as a success. And by doing that, it slowed my other parts of my brain down as well and gave me a sense of purpose. And I guess the same happened at school. You know, I'd kept everything bottled up and I portrayed this perfect average guy, but internally I was an absolute mess. But on the outside, it was, you know, picture perfect, stereotypical stereotypical guy from the northern suburbs of Adelaide. Same in relationships. I tried to be the perfect partner. And even as I became a dad, I tried to be the perfect dad. But all these things, you, you can only hold up a bar of perfectionism for so long before you, your arms get too tired to hold up that bar anymore. And that's exactly what happened when I burnt out in 2020 is that I couldn't keep reaching those lofty heights of perfectionism. They started to crumble and, and it showed in the workplace, but it also showed at home. It was coming out in my studies and my master's degree. And all of a sudden, I could no longer put the mask on anymore. It had to come off for me to breathe finally, for me to to let go of all this internal pain and start living a more authentic life. And so that's what happened with 2020 is it was really important for me to take off that mask, to create the Instagram account, to create the YouTube and the and my podcast. But one of the important things was also to go back to work and hold a meeting with my team and share my burnout story because I knew other people in the workplace were also experiencing things like burnout, workplace stress, all that type of stuff, but no one openly talked about it. And so I felt that was really useful for me as a healing process, but also to show other people, hey, burnout's happening in our workplace. We need to talk about that because we need to support each other. We need to encourage other, each other to go get help. We need to have this discussion so that the the management and the leadership of our organization, and I'm talking about a national organization here, can see that things aren't as squeaky clean as they make it out to be. And so that was a real big catalyst for that. But it all came from, yeah, 30 years living with mental illness, trying to keep this perfect persona up, and eventually it all just come, come crumbling down to a point where I needed to let go and to needed to start living more authentically and with greater purpose. Oh, absolutely. And look, what a journey, man, because at the end of the day, the one thing about what you're telling me is it's like fish don't see the water. We don't see the air we're breathing. This is all around us and all the men or the people that are supposed to be guiding us or helping us. Uh, or showing us the way are also going through all of this stuff without them uh, being very open and upfront with it. You see, Simon, I blame Hollywood. Like you mentioned, you know, the Terminator and all these other films, but I also really blame the Western cowboy type um you know shows where there's this lone ranger who just shows up to a um you know a saloon in in the middle of the desert and then he goes in orders a drink and then he beats everybody else in the in the bar and then he walks out and rides into the sunset yeah. and i think that's the illusion that a lot of people now have as to how they should show up in the world and how they should actually um present themselves when they are actually dying inside now you mentioned something that also you know struck a bit of a, a nerve with me when you said um you know men are not allowed to show emotion or cry when when you broke down and cried did you get any support this is an interesting moment and timing is everything in life and and particularly in a mental health story 
at that point of time, yeah, I got an amazing support from my manager. I actually had my manager and my team leader on, on, on the line and I was working from home. So this was during COVID and I was working from home at that point. And the phone went quiet because I was, I was tearing up and I was barely able to get the words out, but they were immensely supportive. And as I recovered over that period, I, I was talking a lot with my manager about that. She was managing our, our local site, but a few different sites across Southeast Queensland as well. And she said, Simon, if that had happened maybe a year earlier, you probably wouldn't have got that same level of support. And it was not so much about her. It was about the systems in place in the organisation and some of the, the other leadership that was in place as well. And the whole focus of the organisation was on outputs, not on outcomes. And what had happened over COVID, and, and I actually thank COVID for this, is that COVID enabled people to talk up about their mental health. I just happened to do it in a very public way, <laughs> in a very public way. But if if COVID didn't happen, I think my outcome would have been very different if I had opened up. And in fact, I do recall there being some pressure from those former higher up leadership, you know, people to asking what's Simon doing? What's going on with Simon? Why isn't the output where it should be? And so it, it coincided with the perfect timing, but I know other people in the same organisation, but also in the same industry in the public service more broadly, haven't had that same level of support. And I and I, I look back to around 2000 and I want to say 13, 14, and I was in a different organisation, so still in the public service, different organisation. It was the first time I'd ever heard the con this, this phrase or concept of, I want to have a Duna day or I want to have a mental health day from work and i'm like oh, i've never heard of someone saying that you know at the time my mental health was was mostly okay and and i thought oh you know every now and then my my mental health does flare up i haven't still haven't told anybody that i live with this type of stuff and so one day i just didn't feel like doing the two-hour trek to work and i was really struggling and i and i called my boss and i said i can't come in because i'm just i'm just not doing that well mentally I didn't say for mental health. I just said for mentally. And my manager at the time, she said, oh, Simon, thanks so much for being honest. Most people would just say that their kids are sick or they're sick or whatever, but thanks so much for being honest about that. And I felt really good. And I'm like, oh, maybe mental health discussions now that it's 2013, 14, 15 are, are good, are positive. But what happened next is a week later, I was in a team meeting and that same person said to the team that, ringing up and saying that you're sick because you're not doing well mentally is not a good enough reason to have a sick day. And so obviously that moment in time wasn't the right time for, for a mental health discussion or that person wasn't the right person to have that. And fast forward to, yeah, to 2020 when it happened again in a different organisation, different boss. And, yeah, for, for, for that new boss to say, yeah, 12 months ago that that this conversation could have gone very differently was was huge and Thank Co. I thank COVID for it every day. And I know we joked a bit about COVID before and lockdowns, and it did cause a lot of drama and stuff like that in my household, but it also, it enabled me to talk about mental health. And I think it's enabled so many more people across across the world to talk about their mental health. Um, and yeah, like we even saw like the government, for example, the Australian government increase mental health care treatment plans to to 20 sessions during COVID. And unfortunately, they've reverted it back to 10. And I wish they would have kept it at 20 because for anyone who's lived with mental illness, supporting someone through 10 sessions, yeah, most people can do that. But for people that have prolonged mental health challenges, you, you, you're on such a roller coaster. Like I could be in and out of a mental health clinic every six to nine months or so. And so 10 sessions doesn't go very far. And so COVID was great, but I think we're reverting back a little bit. I'd like to see us progress more as a nation um, in the in the mental health care delivery as well. Absolutely. And I really appreciate that you you took the liberty to really um, you know, showcase that support is available when it's needed. And we'll probably go into what it is that you do a little bit later on. But I'm still intrigued uh into, you know, now the movement from the cry and for me, I think the cry would have been the straw that actually did uh, break the camel's back, okay? If you would allow me to sort of maybe 
explain this because you you've also said that your podcast goes to different you know nations africa and everything else um i'm not sure if 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 this is you know resonating but in these other cultures where your podcast is going there's what's called an initiation uh ceremony where men or women are told or tapped on the shoulder that it is your um turn to lead all right so you know from being um you know a kid to like growing into a fully fledged adult that now can take responsibility and there's a lot of crying that happens uh during those times because there's a lot of pain um that they are made or forced to endure yes i mean if, depending on who is looking at this it's it might be brutal and painful and um there's an episode where um Hamish and Andy go to Brazil and then they put their hands in 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 a basket that they get beaten by ants and Hamish is breathing in pain throughout the whole night would you maybe classify this moment as having been your own personal initiation process because you changed after that yeah i yeah. I would say so. It's probably like it's 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 probably where the trickle turned into a waterfall. I would say, and I think back to 2011 when I first went into that GP's office and I said, "I think I got a mental health condition." I never cried during that process, but that was the the initial raindrops, I guess you could say, on the top of the mountain that that started to to soften things up a little bit enough for me to keep going at it and talking about it over the next ten years or so. And then as I progressed, you know, into the, the burnout story, I think, yeah, definitely that was where those first few teardrops or trickles turned into an absolute, it was almost like a, a, a flood, like where, you know, just there's so much water and so much anguish and pain that came with that, that it wasn't just releasing the 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 difficulties associated with burnout, but it was also releasing 25 35 years of keeping it quiet of actually going you know what this is the real me like i'm taking off that mask and, you, and now you're seeing the true me the true what's happening inside my mind and my body and my heart and my soul and so i do think that it, it probably was a bit of an initiation moment um and quite an outwardly it had to go outwards. It couldn't go inward anymore. Like if I kept it in, I don't know if I'd still be here today. It was that painful to 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 get to that stage and to release it. But I'm so glad it did happen because now I have so much more clarity in my mind. I have greater purpose. I'm on a new career path, as we mentioned before, and I'm so grateful for that happening. But it was yeah, it was a very difficult time. Wow. Well, congratulations, man. I mean, obviously, it's it's not easy for somebody to go through that. And not a lot of people are willing to do the work that it entails. I mean, you went on and became a couch potato, you know, like what you mm -hmm. said. But during that time, you then started your road towards the mend. OK, how has mindfulness sort of played a role in your own recovery and the work that you now do with men? Yeah, absolutely. So. When I started therapy 11 years ago, it was around that cognitive behavioral therapy. It was around treating depression primarily. So I remember going to that clinical psychologist, you know, session and getting diagnosed with depression and anxiety, but also obsessive compulsive disorder. And I, and I, I knew that I had depression to a lesser extent, ex anxiety, never even heard of OCD. And so that was something that was never also treated as well so every time i went to a, a psychologist or a counselor or even a mental health social worker these days they were always targeting the depression because these are the this is the big one that everyone focuses on when we talk about mental health in australia we talk about oh you must be depressed like yeah but what i found is as i went and progressed through my therapy journey when I started to challenge, to challenge these other things like obsessive compulsive disorder with the right therapy, so not so much cognitive behavioral therapy, but exposure response prevention, which is specific for OCD, I could start to heal in better ways as well. And, and along that journey, I was introduced to, to mindfulness. 
And it started actually through my burnout story when I went to a, an accredited mental health social worker, introduced me to this cons- this this new type of therapy called acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a mindfulness based practice. And but her first int- my first introduction to it was her saying, "Oh, Simon, how about we just think of the three things you're grateful for?" So let's let's look at gratitude. Like, oh yeah, that sounds good, but internally. <laughs> internally the male version of me came out. I was like, I'm not doing that. Like that sounds a bit woo woo or girly or whatever it is. Um, But I gave it a go for a little bit, but it just didn't, it didn't sit quite right at the time. And, and so I parked it and then I went on my, went on my way, you know, recovered back from burnout. But then about another 12 to 18 months later, I found myself back into a psychologist's room, a different psychologist, someone who could teach me mindfulness in a different way. So it was less around, well, part of it was gratitude, but then it was also breathing right. How do we breathe properly to to overcome anxiety? How do we use our five senses to ground ourselves and be in the moment? And this was particularly important for me because, again, my OCD brain would have me on a different planet half the time. And what I was noticing, the when I'm in a bad way, I'm not really present with my my wife and kids. I'm thinking about all these other things. I'm not where my feet are basically and they'll be talking at me for 10 minutes and nothing would sink in and so working out strategies to ground myself and be present in the moment um, have been really useful and they've become I guess the foundation of the work that I do now in Mindful Men it's how can I support guys through my own me going to therapy and my own story as well but also the theoretical aspects around learning through social work is how can I support them to be present in the moment with the loved ones or their work colleagues or their sports team or whoever it is in a way that doesn't just involve gratitude journaling. You know, it's, it's, it's being grateful for things and and recognizing those positive things in our lives, but not doing it in a way that seems regimented or seems like homework. It just seems like an everyday normal thing. And so we do a lot of grounding. We do a little bit of gratitude, but we do it differently as well. We look at the the small everyday things, and that could be a conversation like this, an amazing conversation we've had or a new connection, or maybe it's as simple as that awesome cup of coffee you had when you first got up out of bed or the fact that you had a shower today or today's the first day you got out of bed for the week or maybe the first day this week that you got the kids to school on time, you know? very simple everyday things that we often overlook and so looking into how mindfulness works in that space is something that i've really loved doing myself and so that's what i've been using as a foundation for mindful men and then i've I've discovered that it goes into things like values like so identifying and, and living by your values you know for many of us unless we've been to a professional development day we don't really reflect on values or things like that and so that's a really cool way we've got i've got a deck of cards that i go through with the guys and and we go okay each card's got a value okay what does this value mean to us how important is it to us where do we rank it on the scale and so by discovering those things about ourselves what i love and 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 a mindful i call mindfulness like conscious living as well it enables us to switch off autopilot which leads to things like burnout which is what happened to me i was i was on a bit of autopilot and start living more consciously and with more purpose. And, and it's from a place where it's led by our values. So if, if the guys that I work with are really struggling, I'll, I'll often say to them, like, well, what would what would your values tell you? If you're feeling lost today, what's, something, what's one thing you can do that lives by your values? And so the more we can do this in a mindful way, we can more connect with what's going on in here and, and live with greater joy. And this you know, brings joy back. It brings creativity back. It brings greater connections with each other as well. And we can start to redefine our lives and, and stop, you know, maybe it's it's changing our social circles and redefining who's in our social circles. It's not so much accepting that toxic friend that we've had since high school. It's maybe letting them go and welcoming in someone else who aligns with our values and our purpose these days as well. And so it's all of these things. It's, it's, it's a, it's a hot pot. And and that's what I love about it. It's, it's not one thing. It's not two things. It's something that you can be creative with as well. Um, and that's something I really value. And yeah, it's just something that we can use to live with greater purpose and authenticity. And that's what I'm all about these days is living with that greater authenticity 
It's about taking off that mask, throwing it down and saying, this is the real Simon. Wow. And I'm supposing so many people are just introducing the world uh, to a masked version of themselves and not really showing up in their true essence. And you really, um, you know, really touched upon the whole mindfulness uh, beat there because so many people would have a cup of coffee, but they don't realize what went into that cup of coffee for it to be sitting in front of you you know some person had to you know farm the beans and to grind the beans and package them the whole world had to move for you to have that sip and once you take notice that the world is moving behind to make all these things possible can you imagine what else you can actually start deliberating within your life and kudos for you for um, taking on that path because it takes a lot for somebody who comes from, yeah, she'll be all right, mate, to, hey, <laughs> let's sit down and really look at, um, you know, are we smiling? Are we happy? Are we looking after the kids? Are we not just holding a VB because we are very beta, um, you know, and 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 masking, you know, the actual feelings that we have now? This might not be an easy thing for a lot of men to accept because a lot of men that I know are tradies, they're walking around, it's freezing cold, but they've got shots on just so they can show their manliness and, and everything else that comes along with it. I'm like, put on a jumper, bro. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's, it's, it's all good. How do you then create or how do you manage to create a safe and supportive environment for men to actually open up and start seeking help? Yeah, getting men into therapy is the one of the hardest things to do. I mean, for me, it took 20 years to even go to that GP. So a lot of the guys I work with would spend so much of their time not talking about things. So getting them to actually go, yeah, I need help for one, that's a huge issue. And I think that's reflective in the way that mental health is in Australia. If you think about daily deaths by suicide, there's nine every day in Australia and seven a male. So we really do struggle to talk about stuff to the point where it becomes like that's where many guys, and we're talking about seven out of nine every single day, feel that that's their only option is just to end it. But it's not their only option. Talking about it, it's the hardest thing to do. But once you do it, it becomes so much easier. And the more you talk about it, the easier it is. But getting them in is the, is the hardest part. What I love about my journey is, is I've been a consumer of the mental health system through as a client, but also now as a practitioner. And so I know what I like as, as a guy going into therapy. And sometimes I like going into a clinic and sitting on a couch and talking, but it's not always the best thing for me. And so what I do is I do therapy differently. So what I do is I might pick up a guy and we might just go for a drive in the car. And we've got music playing very softly in the background, but it gives us that space where we can see the environment around us. We're not looking at each other. We're looking out to the world and we can have that incidental discussion like two mates having like two really good mates having an inter incidental discussion. And in between that, I can throw in a tool or a tip or some insight into lived experience of mental illness, which can help guys to go oh you know what you know this is more of a workshop almost as we as we're driving along there's other ex examples where there was a guy that loved basketball so we grabbed a basketball we went down to the local basketball ring and that's where therapy happened on the basketball court um the same guy you know he'd lived next to the beach for over a year but he'd never been in the water and he wanted to do that so what did we do <laughs> i I'm, I'm the guy in the t-shirt I, I can i can do this because i'm on the sunshine coast as well but we went down to the water and I, we stripped off and we just had our shorts on and that's that's where the therapy happened. It happened, you know, shoulder deep in in water on the Sunshine Coast. And we're doing we we're doing grounding techniques as, as our technique for the day. And it was just the perfect spot to do it because we're tuning into the our touch and how the cold water felt on our body and how it made us feel better. There's other guys, video games. You know, I work with younger, younger guys as well, you know, teenagers who video games, that's that's their outlet. And Fortunately enough, I grew up playing video games and so I love it as well. And so we could sit there playing video games together and having that in incidental banter, trying to get through a level on a game, but also talking about some of the stuff that they might be struggling with. Like, is it someone bullying them at school or something like that? 
And we can talk about that in a way that doesn't feel like therapy. Or is it, you know, walking a dog? I had a, I work with a guy who used to be a farmer and then he had a stroke and now he can't be a farmer anymore. And so that's infected his mobility and his ability to walk his dog. So we grab the lead and I walk the dog for him as we're walking along. And we're going literally 100, 100 metres up the road and back. That's all we can do in an hour because of his mobility is so impacted. But it gives him a time to to walk his dog. It gives us the time to chat and get some incidental exercise, which is fantastic as well for our mental health. And it's the same discussion that would be held in a clinic or on a telehealth Zoom call or a phone call, but it's just out in community. And, and that's what I love about doing this differently is that it can look so different every single day. I mean, the amount of times I spend on the beaches on the Sunshine Coach, on the Sunshine Coast with other guys walking up and down the same beaches, you know, I'm there probably three or four times a week with different guys just doing beach therapy, walking and talking on the beach. And it's like, it's the best. Like I love it as a, as a practitioner, but also as someone just supporting another guy and by taking it out of the clinic, it just helps to break down the stigma and the shame around it. You know, cause when you walk into a clinic, you're walking into a mental health clinic. It says mental health clinic on the side or psychology or counselor or social worker, whatever it is. But if we take it outside to the beach or the basketball court, there's none of that there. It's just two guys hanging out or what what look like they're just hanging out. But then I come in with, as you know, as I said before, the incidental discussions around mental health tips or tools or strategies or insight. Maybe it's just education, like what is depression? What is burnout? What is masculinity? You know, what does it look like between 2023 and 2003 and then 1983, for example? And so this is how we get guys in. We do things a little bit differently. And once they're in, they they do enjoy it. I mean, they've got a pretty high success rate in, can, in terms of retention. The biggest stressor, I think, for most people at the moment is finances and just being able to pay for it. So I'm fortunate that I work in the NDIS space. So I do a lot of stuff in the in the disability space, but also work cover, which is funded by you know different government agencies. But until I get my med- mental health accreditation, which is two years post grad. I do a lot of private stuff as well. And so those guys, they've either got to, you know, have enough money to do that, or I have to, I refer them on to, to other, other practitioners who can bulk bill or even beyond blue, who've got the free mental health coaching at the moment as well. So I'm often referring out where I know someone might not be able to afford my services too. Absolutely. And obviously you really do paint a very uh, interesting picture. You know, if you're just going to go for a drive with a mate or, you know, playing basketball, it doesn't really put that confrontation of lying on a couch and tell me your problems. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? So um, good on you for, you know, taking the alternative route. And I mean, obviously, like you said, you're a consumer of these services. You, so you would have known what actually worked for you and what wasn't uh, working for you. Now, how can the people watching this uh, show maybe be able to reach out to you so they can um, get to find out more about some of the activities that you take people on and if see if they're a perfect fit uh, for your therapy. Yeah, absolutely. So the website's probably the easiest place. Um, I mean, you can Google me. I'm all over the place on different social media, but the website's www.mindful-men.com.au and that accesses things about my therapy, but also the Mindful Men podcast where I share my story, but also the story of people across the world, my different social medias. I'm on most of the social media platforms as well. And I do the social media stuff in the podcast as a way to just show guys, hey, if Simon can talk about his mental health, then maybe I can too. Or if this guest can talk about their mental health, then maybe I can too. And we talk about a range of different topics, not just mental health, because you know when a guy comes into therapy, it's not just about mental health sometimes. It could be about parenting challenges or relationship issues or workplace stress. It could be just how do I manage a small business or something like that? So it is diverse as well. We, we have to, I think, move away from therapy being just mental health. It's sometimes just a good way to tune up the car, you know, and get things thinking clearly. Or maybe it's just some more mindfulness strategies. Maybe it's Simon, teach me how to do gratitude in a different way. That that means something to me because I want to feel more positive about stuff. It doesn't mean I've got depression, anxiety, stress, or whatever it is. It's just how can I live more authentically? And so 
yeah, the website's definitely the place to be. But yeah, if you want to see me on socials, yeah, I'm all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic obviously i'll be putting in all that information um you know in the show notes just so that uh you know our audience has a way to get in touch with you now simon obviously there's somebody who's watching this show right now has been looking for the skip button for a while but then you keep coming up with a very interesting um thing and they're like okay all right i'll just give him one more minute and they are hell bent on thinking i'll be all right she'll be all right none of this stuff i'm not gonna need to go sing kumbaya um you know in order for me to enjoy a drink with the mates at the pub or things of that nature what would you tell such a man and what what would you encourage them to do, um, you know, in order for them to be doing, have a happier existence? Well, about five affirmations came to mind as you were saying that. But I think there's two that are, for, are specific for guys. There's one is it's not weak to speak. It's not a weak thing that if you have emotional distress or mental health challenges, disability, whatever it is, it's it's actually a positive thing to speak up and talk about it, find that safe person. So just know that in yourself, like, doesn't make you any less of a guy to talk about stuff. The second one is, and this was critical for mine, is is I love this Tony Robbins quote. It's like pain, change happens when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. I love it because what it tells me is that it was like when that time I started crying, it's like the pain became too much. I couldn't keep being the same old Simon. I had to change in order to be better or to grow. And, you know, it might come across in this in this show that I am better and I've got all things sorted. It's a roller coaster. Like, you know, last week I was the complete opposite of what it might appear today. And next week I might be down or up. It it, it is a roller coaster ride. It's a journey that I will go at my own pace. And it's okay to have these ups and downs. And I don't have it all sorted out. Most of us don't. Even therapists, like I'm a therapist and I'm a lived experience therapist. I don't have all the answers either. But what I can do is provide safe spaces. And so can your therapist, your local therapist, your local GP, could be your partner, it could be your best mate. Find that right safe support person and just start talking because the more we talk, the greater chance we also have of bringing that suicide data down as well. You know, no longer would it be seven out of nine deaths by suicide, a male. You start bringing it down and, and you know, I can re reel off a whole bunch of other stats, but I won't because I don't want them to skip. <laughs> but yeah, just start talking because it, it does wonders and it's not weak to speak. Fantastic. Now, Simon, if you were to go back and meet Simon who was crying, bawling his eyes out, what would you tell, tell him right now? This one often comes up to me whenever I'm in some sort of distress is that you're meant to be here. There's points in our time in our lives where things don't work out and things do work out and you're just in that moment and that's just where you needed to be at that particular moment. If if you're crying or if I'm crying, that 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 version of me at 2020 when I burnt out, but also when I was eight or when I went into that doctor's office at, at 28, these are moments in time where I needed to to experience that in order to understand who I am as a person. And it's not something to hide away from. It's something that just goes, okay, this is, yeah, this is part of me. This is something that I can use either to prompt change or maybe to accelerate change or or to also, if, you, if you're in a good space, to celebrate that as well. And so it's multifaceted, but just recognizing that I needed to be where I need to be at certain points is really important because we don't have it figured out. We've all, we're have we all running our own race. And that's really important to reflect on too. Absolutely. I love that statement because, you know, if we don't go through our go-throughs, then we're not going to get the breakthroughs that will actually then result in the life that we now share. And usually when things are happening, you might feel like you are a seed that is being buried yet you're actually being planted and it takes a redemptive amount of work for you to then step out of that because nobody knows how many apples 
are in one seed. And you, my friend, are a testimony of that. I viscerally believe, Simon, that we're here to live, we're here to learn, and we're here to contribute. And obviously, you would have lived what you thought was the life, but then you went on and learned. You learned mindfulness. You learned to care about other people besides yourself. And now you're sending the elevator down, contributing to others so they too can be, do, and have a happier existence. My question to you now is you've been down and out. You've cried. You are now helping other people. You the you're the Kleenex guy now. Yeah. You <laughs> passing the, the Kleenex to the other guys. What's what's next um with, with with Simon? What can we expect in the evolution of what you're creating right now? Absolutely. I love talking about this. So at the moment, I'm a sole trader. It's just me. It's it's more of a mindful man and then mindful men. But I, I consider all the clients that I work with, all the people that follow me on social media to be part of the community of mindful men. But the next step is have mindful men across Australia in cars. Well, I drive a ute with mindful men stickers all over it. So people know I'm coming down the road. And I want to, I've got a vision for seeing more of that around of mobile therapists who can go and meet people where they're at, guys particularly, take them onto basketball courts across Australia, for example, or cafes across Australia, and and create these community hubs as well, these mindful men hubs where guys can come together and connect with each other and, and feel part of something bigger than just what's going on inside their heads. And so they're community spaces of healing, of growth, of connection. Because I think one of the, the things that we haven't spoken today about is the sense of loneliness that a lot of guys experience and particularly given in a, in a 2023, when we live such a nomadic lifestyle, like I'm on the sunny coast. I grew up in Adelaide. I lived in Canberra where I met my wife. We moved to Hobart. We lived in Brisbane and now the sunny coast. So we're one of those nomadic families that, that always chasing greener pastures. And now we've finally set roots down on the sunny coast. There's so many other guys like this who move around or maybe they do fly in, fly out, drive in, drive out type of work who feel disconnected from community. And so a future version of Mindful Men will be these community hubs that enable guys to come together and go, you know what, this is my place. This is my home away from home. This is where I can connect with another guy, do some self-development, grab a coffee, do some therapy. Maybe it's a gym workout. Maybe it's a barbecue on a Friday night, whatever it is and just connecting with other people so they can feel part of something and not feel so isolated in the world. Well, talking about being isolated, I just spent almost 30 minutes with you right now. I will never feel lonely again. I feel like a mindful man uh, just having had you, um, you know, on the show today. And I really appreciate the time and the expertise that you lay down uh, with us. And especially your story, man, because that really will get other people to actually understand that they too can get help. Thank you. Absolutely. Prosper, I, I thank you for, for what you're doing. I love what you do. But holding space and, and in the mental health space, people always ask me, Simon, how do you have a mental health discussion? You've just proved how you do it. You just hold space. You ask questions. You give space for someone to talk about whatever's going through their mind. And it can look pretty messy sometimes. And I'm all over the place half the time. But that's exactly how you do it. So thank you so much for holding space for me and, and giving me an opportunity to talk about Mindful Men. Well, thank you for sharing your valuable insights and experiences with us today. It's truly inspiring to see the work that you're doing to support other men's uh, mental health through mindful men. If you were anybody else, you would have just, you know, rolled into fetal position and became, you know, war is me and not worry about helping other people, but you are extending um, your hand to also help those that might not seemingly see that they need this help. So on behalf of the whole entire world, man, thank you. Thank you. All right. Now, for those that are watching, remember, if you're struggling with your mental health, you don't have to face it alone. Like what Simon says, uh, reach out, seek help and prioritize your own well-being. I really hope you can join us next time on the Online Prosperity Show for more empowering conversations like this. Well, take care and be well. Bye for now.